Und deshalb bin ich auch äh, sehr And that is why I am very concerned about the upcoming NATO summit in Washington this July. They want to usher in a new era there, namely a global NATO without territorial restrictions. This means that NATO could also act in Asia and thus against China. That's what this next summit is about. Darum geht es bei diesem nächsten Gipfel. Das finde ich sehr schön gesagt, aber ich habe jetzt trotzdem noch ein paar Fragen. Also I find that very well said, but I still have a few questions. You are in German politics and you see how everything is moving. You have been in the Bundestag for almost 20 years, and there was once a Germany of Willy Brandt and Ostpolitik. There was once an independent Germany. Even under Angela Merkel, there was a Germany that said, no, we need Nord Stream, period. And then there was Mr. Scholz, standing next to Joe Biden, who says, if Russia does anything with Ukraine, attacks, then Nord Stream is over. And Olaf Scholz just stands there. I have the feeling that Olaf Scholz is always being criticized a lot. But in general, Germany seems to be simply caught up in this NATOization at the moment, as you say, and also to be mentally and politically trapped. Can you somehow explain to our viewers from the political process why the Bundestag just watches and goes along with it? Erklären, warum da auch der Bundestag einfach zuschaut und mitmacht? Naja, man macht, man schaut ja nicht nur zu. Well, one doesn't just watch, one actually actively participates. One has agreed to the northern expansion of NATO. One has supported the fatal decision of the Bucharest NATO summit in 2008 to give Georgia and Ukraine the perspective. Now we see what is happening in Georgia and Moldova, and the entire imperial policy of the EU towards states that make sovereign and democratic decisions like the USA did in 1938 with their Foreign Agents Registration Act. Georgia wants to introduce a similar transparency law for foreign influence and is being pilloried for it. And this is actively supported with promotion. One is not just a bystander. What I can observe is that we are increasingly having an influence also in politics, in the media, and in the economy, in all three central areas in the Federal Republic of Germany. From American interest groups, there is a very clear interconnection, for example, in the American think tanks, whether it is the German Marshall Fund, the Atlantic Brücke, the Atlantic Council, or many other think tanks that are clearly aimed at representing American interests. In, diesen think tanks sind an Front mit dabei. in these think tanks, department heads from major daily newspapers or media, even from public broadcasting, are at the forefront and are part of these committees. I would wish that these journalists were active in the committees of the international peace movement. That would indeed be a contribution to international understanding and not to representing the interests of American think tanks and foundations that clearly say America first. It is no different in politics. Many politicians, except us from the Bundestag, are members of the Atlantic Brücke and many other various transatlantic committees. And of course, they are also influenced or integrated we even have the case also in the government in Germany that individual members have previously gone through training programs of American foundations or associations, private organizations. I find that highly problematic and concerning. The same applies to the economy. Many people in the global south whom I meet just shake their heads and say, how can it be that politics actually only follows the allegiance of the USA and does what the USA says? tatsächlich nur noch in der Gefolgschaft der USA und macht, was die USA sagt. Aber warum tut das die Wirtschaft? Die Wirtschaft muss doch ein Interesse haben an eigenen Gewinnen. But why does the economy do that? The economy must have an interest in its own gains and profits. Therefore, it helps to look at the ownership structures of the major economic companies in Germany. The largest DAX companies in Germany have American firms like BlackRock as their biggest shareholders. BlackRock is the largest shareholder among the top eight German DAX companies. Naturally, one wonders how decision-making processes come about. 
who ultimately makes the decisions. And that perhaps also explains how it is ultimately decided whether to actually decide against the interests of the German population or the German industry, or to make decisions in such a way that they ultimately satisfy the interests of the American market. This is how I explain the entire decision-making processes, why and how decisions are made. It is really worth taking a look at it to untangle where these actors are actually organized, from whom they get their information and handouts. Sometimes you get the feeling that some colleagues have only received a memo from the Pentagon, which they are currently presenting. You always hear the same tones, the same choice of words. It's almost eerie in the media, as well as from various representatives. We don't have to believe in a world conspiracy, but there is a group of people who understand each other and enforce their interpretation. Now, we are at the point where we really have the okay to use German and American weapons in Ukraine directly against Russia. This has enormous escalation potential if the Russians shoot back. The assumption is always that Russia must be punished and that Russia, when punished, will retaliate. This only comes to mind when it happens, and then everyone is shocked. This escalation spiral continues to turn. Do you see any way to end this somehow before we end up in the fifth major European war in 400 years? Im fünften generellen europäischen Krieg in 400 Jahren landen. I have to say that I am also quite skeptical about this. It shocks me with what carelessness some colleagues downplay and ignore the risk of escalation that clearly exists here. Pretending that there can't be a nuclear disaster in the end, where everyone will lose, is irresponsible. All sides will lose, and it is completely irrelevant who ends up being right in some way. This discussion about international law, whether it mandates or permits something, is completely absurd. One must have a discussion about what is politically necessary. What is politically reasonable in such a situation? It's not just about international law. Above all, those who point fingers at Russia should question their own self-image. 25 years ago, they attacked Yugoslavia and redrew borders themselves through the illegal secession of Kosovo. At the same time, they caused a million deaths by invading Iraq. To this day, the war crimes committed there have not been atoned for or prosecuted. On the contrary, journalists like my friend Julian Assange, who made public the war crimes of NATO in Afghanistan or the USA and its allies in Iraq, have been stuck in the high-security prison in Belmarsh in London for years and are threatened with 175 years in prison in the USA because he, as a journalist, told us the truth. He showed that there are no surgically clean wars, with that wars and war policies are simply dirty and associated with human rights violations and crimes against humanity. He's being persecuted. I have to say, pointing the moralizing finger at others, this finger points back at oneself. And there I see this ignorance, arrogance, and hubris that risk the lives and safety of the population in Europe. That shakes me. Also those who act contrary to the fact that fewer and fewer Ukrainians want to go to war. We have 700,000 Ukrainian men who have fled to Europe because they do not want to die in the war. Shortly after the new recruitment law in Ukraine, the mobilization law, there were 95,000 railway refugees in Ukraine because they did not report as required by this law. Only one in five of military age is willing to go to the front in Ukraine. And despite the fact that fewer and fewer Ukrainians want to go to this dangerous war, there are such debates here 
from armchair strategists, whether among the Greens, the Social Democrats, the FDP, or especially the Union. They want to continue this war at the expense and lives of Ukrainians in their illusion of being able to achieve a victory against Russia, a nuclear power. And I find that really extremely dangerous. And that is what we are experiencing today with the permission for the use of German weapons in Ukraine against Russia in this war. This is a new level of escalation because it seems that NATO actually wants to create a scenario in Ukraine similar to the Vietnam War. The debate about the deployment of NATO ground troops is being conducted in parallel. Before the USA officially entered the war in 1964 with the fabricated Tonkin incident, there were already 15,000 US advisors on site. After a certain period, soldiers were then sent to protect the advisors. After a certain period, U.S. troops were sent to Vietnam to protect the instructors. It then became quite clear that the deployment of their own training troops further escalated the situation and led to a direct entry of the USA into the war. This seems to be prepared here as well, with the dispatch of German or other weapons that have a range reaching into the major cities in Russia and the dispatch of more and more instructors. We know from the German foreign ministry that there are instructors on site. British Prime Minister Sunak has confirmed that there are English instructors there. The French President Macron speaks quite openly about his plans to send even more NATO troops to Ukraine, and on a larger scale and quite officially. These are really daredevils who need to be stopped. We need to form a large alliance, a cooperation with the countries of the South, to prevent this escalation and the sure path to a third world war. That is why I am very grateful that China and Brazil have now published a joint declaration inviting to a peace conference including Russia. It is completely absurd what the Swiss conference is doing here. So a peace conference without Russia, without the adversaries, makes no sense at all. Therefore, I hope that China and Brazil will take the lead in an initiative for an actual end to this war. It must be stopped because it really has great potential for escalation. If NATO has direct involvement in the war, it will ultimately come down to how Russia reacts. We should not underestimate Russia's reactions. In this context, I am also concerned that there is even this discussion about Western weapons and targets in Russia. I am equally worried about the deployment of more and more trainers from NATO. The Kiev government, which has dispensed with democratic elections and also massively suppresses the opposition, even murdering some abroad, is acting irresponsibly here. With their attacks on the Russian nuclear forces, they are playing with the fire of a nuclear war. They attack the Russian nuclear forces in Armaris with drones. According to the Russian nuclear doctrine, this is an attack on Russia and its nuclear forces. If one believes that this can further draw NATO into this war, it is not only the security and lives of the population in Ukraine that are at stake, but also the security and lives of millions of people across Europe. And it's not about absolving Russia of all guilt. You also write in your book that the invasion on February 24, 2022, is a violation of international law. We all admit that. But it must also be possible to distinguish between what is lawful and what is wise. More use of weapons against Russia will not make Russia say, OK, I'll withdraw everything, unless they were to lose. Because at the moment, Russia is not losing. They are not losing this war. And Ukraine has every interest in further escalating this war. It seems that the Europeans are happy to go along with it. Would you perhaps like to say something in closing about how you would try to work towards an agreement with China and other non-European states? <laughs> 
Menschen auf, einen, auf, einen Frieden, auf eine Einigung hinzudrängen. Nun, ähm, wir haben erstmal einen äh, guten Punkt äh, angesprochen. Well, you have raised a good point. Of course, this is a war in violation of international law started by Russia. They have broken the prohibition of the use of force in international relations as outlined in the UN Charter. This is a clear violation of the prohibition of the use of force. But every war also has a history. This includes the shared responsibility of the West, especially NATO and the USA. That is why I am very concerned about the upcoming NATO summit in Washington this July. There they want to usher in a new era, namely a global NATO without territorial restrictions, which also extends to Asia and thus targets China. That is what this next summit is about. Darum geht es bei diesem nächsten Gipfel. Und das macht mir halt Sorge, weil so wie man eigentlich... And that worries me, because since the mid-1990s, an expansion policy against Russia has been pursued, breaking all mutual promises. Now NATO is moving into Asia and wants to expand against China, according to the USA, the main enemy. China is the main enemy. And NATO is also trying to establish itself here as an anti-Chinese military pact, in the form of bilateral security agreements with the Pacific region or with the arming of frontline states against China, such as the Philippines, which are being used. And that really worries me. One must not forget the background stories because they are the key to resolving the conflict. Sie quasi auch der Schlüssel sind zu einer Lösung des Konfliktes. Und da ist auch die Lösung äh, bei dem Ukraine-Krieg. And that is where the solution for the Ukraine war lies. We need to return to a negotiation situation, as was the case in Istanbul in the spring of 2022. At that time, Ukraine had a much better starting position than now. This means we need to achieve the neutrality of Ukraine. Ultimately, it will come down to Ukraine remaining neutral. The integration into NATO structures must be reversed. There needs to be a rollback so that the American bases and operations on the border with Russia in Ukrainian territory are ended and withdrawn. Im ukrainischen Land und äh, dass man sich dort zurückzieht. Also das wird, ist die einzige Möglichkeit, wo ich einen Nachhalt. So, this is the only way I see a sustainable peace. Many other experts see it the same way. According to the Istanbul negotiations, even Ukraine was almost in agreement with a neutral status, of course under the condition that there would also be a withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine. I hope that China, Brazil, or even Pope Francis can actually help to reach a solution here. This proxy war of NATO poses a great danger to world peace, not just to peace in Ukraine. This war is terrible and should be ended. It indeed poses a great danger to global peace. Therefore, all states must stand together and do everything in their power to de-escalate and achieve relaxation. German foreign policy would be well advised to stop traveling around the world like a schoolmaster, wanting to lecture others with a moralizing finger and of course being completely untrustworthy in its double standards. Natürlich völlig unglaubwürdig zu sein in der Doppelmoral, Stichwort Waffenexporte und Komplizenschaft mit Israel im Keyword arms exports and complicity with Israel in the terrible Gaza war for example. And it is no longer taken seriously at all. We need to return to a policy that focuses on diplomacy, balancing interests, mutual security, good neighborly relations, international understanding, and disarmament. The prerequisite for this would, of course, be to have a good, neutral status and to be a sovereign democracy, instead of a client state of the NATO leading power USA. Amen. Amen. Ms. Savim Dagdalen, I absolutely agree with you. I have the feeling that we Europeans once again need to be saved from ourselves. Perhaps this time it will come from the Global South. Miss Dagdalen, for those who want to follow you, in German or in English, where should they do that? On Twitter or where? Where should one get information about your work? Yes, preferably. So detailed reports about my work can be found on my homepage savimdagdelen.de, but for current fast-paced updates, of course, there's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or now also on TikTok. I will put all the links in the description. Ms. Dagdelen, thank you very much for your time today.
Zeit heute. Thank you, Mr. Laraz.